thank you so very much. Thank you very much for being with us for this exciting program tonight. It's a thrill to be welcoming Oliver Bluma, CEO of Porsche AG, Tilo Kozlowski, CEO of Porsche Digital, and Tim Higgins of the Wall Street Journal to our stage tonight. First, some thanks are in order, in particular to Tilo and his colleagues at Porsche Digital and Porsche AG, without whose help and support tonight would not have been possible. So thank you very much. A few words about Churchill Club. We have proudly served for over three remarkable decades as the premier independent stage for conversations about business and technology here in the Silicon Valley region. We present about 24 programs annually in support of our mission to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we always ask our speakers to contribute new insights and new perspectives that they have not delivered elsewhere and never to pitch or promote. If you're not already following us, we invite you to do so on Facebook, LinkedIn, our mailing list, and Twitter. And the hashtag tonight, by the way, is simply Churchill Club. So thank you very much for your attention. And let's now give a very warm welcome to our speakers and Tim. Welcome. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm Tim Higgins. I'm with the Wall Street Journal. I write about the future of cars here from San Francisco. I spent almost a decade in Detroit writing about cars uh, there in the global industry and then some time out here writing about tech. And now we're putting it all together at the most perhaps interesting time in the automotive industry since 1903 when Henry Ford was doing some things back in Detroit. Uh, how about we start off maybe a short introduction of who we are and then we'll uh, start getting into questions. Yeah, maybe I start. Um, hello, good evening. My name is Oliver Blume. Thanks for coming, and I'm looking forward um, to talk a bit about um, the future of uh, automobility and um, especially about the future of, um, of sports cars. And I hope you can understand my hard German accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, 49 years old, uh, married, uh, have two children. And I'm a mechanical engineer and started my career in Audi, where I worked um, over 10 years. Then I went for five years to Barcelona, to Spain. Uh, then spent um, four years in Volkswagen. And during my career, um, I spent uh, one year in South Africa, uh, one year in Mexico, and um, spent a long time in, in China. And um, being in touch uh, with the development there in, in the country. And um, started in uh, 2013 in uh, Porsche, in charge of um, the head of production. And two years ago, I became head um, and CEO of uh, Porsche, and now driving Porsche to the future. Great. Hi, my name is Tilo Koslowski. I actually recognize a bunch of faces in the audience. It's great to be back again. Um, I've been with Porsche now for one and a half years. I'm working for this gentleman right here next to me, which is great. It's a great pleasure. We'll talk more about this uh, tonight. Prior to that, I used to work for a company called Gartner, technology advisory company, where I founded the automotive and smart mobility practice uh, almost 20 years ago. No, actually 20 years ago, 1997, here in the Valley. And since then, I've been working with a lot of the automotive companies, technology companies, investors, uh, and startups and met a bunch of great people here in the Valley, but also in other places of the world. But I still believe this place here is very unique, and we'll talk about this. And I'm super excited to be part of Porsche now. I've been a child, you know, since childhood, a fan of Porsche, and then spent my first money on those cars, even though I couldn't afford them, which was great business. I bought a lot of cars from Porsche. Uh, my wife didn't like that too much, but uh, it's part of the way it goes. And now I can actually put a lot of the things that I talked about in all these years, in those two decades, really into motion at Porsche at the most interesting time, as Tim mentioned, for the automotive industry. And there's no other brand that I can think of that can actually be a leader in this transformation, in this digital transformation than Porsche. Okay, so we're, we're gonna hit some topics here that I think everybody in the room really wants to hear from. Uh, electric electrification of the vehicle and the automation of the vehicle, self-driving cars and electric cars. But first, let's set the table. Porsche, maker of 
sports cars. Punches above its weight, probably. Sales up last year globally, almost 240,000. Uh, profits up uh, among the most uh, profitable automakers with gross margins of more than 17%. This is uh, a company making a lot of money. And then let's talk about, let's talk about what people are talking about for the future of cars here. There's some disruptions occurring. We talk about electrification, AI going into the vehicle, ride sharing, the idea of ownership is, is, is up upon us. Deloitte says that, that maybe the $2 trillion annually in revenue tied to the automotive industry here in the States is up for grab for new players. Probably people in this audience. Uh, Boston Consulting estimates that, the quarter, that a quarter of miles driven in the US by 2030 will be in shared autonomous vehicles. And KPMG just this week out with a new study that says that because of ride share and because of autonomous vehicles, new car consumption in the US will probably be cut in half by 2030. So as the CEO of a car company, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, actually, um, our time is, is very exciting, what, what we have to do. But first of all, um, I want to say, um, Porsche will be Porsche in future, uh, like Porsche is today. That's, that's very, very important, and uh, we will build um, fascinating sports cars in future and um, will carry over our heritage and combine it with future technologies. But um, I think um, the secret for future will be um, to have the right combination um, in between uh, new technologies. And um, there I would like to begin with electromobility. And um, a lot of people asking me, what has electromobility to do with, with Porsche? Porsche are the sports cars uh, with the combustion engines, uh, which you can drive very fast. And uh, what, what are you doing there? And my answer is, um, when you've got the opportunity to drive a sporty electric car, you will be fascinated. And um, we are... Um, working on our first um, electric car, um, it's called uh, Mission E, that's, that's the project's name, and we will launch um, in two years. And um, we all, um, already, um, with my colleagues um, from our board, uh, Lutz Meschke is here from finance, had uh, the opportunity to drive the car. And uh, when you get out of the car, everybody is smiling, and um, also their, their petrol head. And um, it is, or it will be, a very typical Porsche. And um, returning to what has electromobility to do with Porsche. Um, Porsche wins um, in uh, three years in a row, um, one of the most um, popular races um, of um, motorsport in Le Mans. And uh, there um, we um, won the race um, with, with plug-in hybrids. And so um, electromobility fits very good to, to Porsche. Well, I think we're, we're teasing the crowd here a little. We need to hear a little bit more about this Mission E. So what are, what are some of the specs? You first revealed this vehicle, the concept vehicle, in 2015. And it's going to be the production versions coming in 2019, right? Yeah. And it hit the market in 2020. And what's it going to cost? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, we, we haven't decided yet. Um, but um, we think uh, it will be um, a bit below of, of Panamera. And um, I think it's not so important what it will cost. Um, it's more, more important uh, what. <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> are, are you taking? That's, that's my colleague from finance. <laughs> for me, for me, it's more important what the car will be able to uh, to drive. Well, what will be able to drive? So, what what's what are some of the specs? How how quick off the line is this thing going to be? <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, we have a, f a special technology. Um, on which we will launch uh, the car. It's an 800 voltage um, technology. It will be um, the first um, car in the market that will come with, with 800 voltage, which um, will allow us to uh, charge um, the car in 50 minutes, um, up to 400 um, kilometers uh, to go. So one and five minutes, 15 mm -hmm. minutes. Yeah, yeah, one five minutes. Could you and maybe get that technology from my phone? <laughs> <laughs> No, for us, it was, was uh, very important um, because um, the acceptance of electromobility has a lot to do with um, the distance you can drive and the charging time. And uh, 15 minutes, I think it's okay to have a coffee and then to, uh, to go on with, with your car. That's one important point. The other point is uh, when we bring a Porsche with electromobility, it has to be fast, and um, we will speed up um, over 250 
kilometers uh, per hour. And uh, what's very important is the acceleration, not only to accelerate uh, one time, um, accelerate several times, uh, whatever you want, and be able to go on a racetrack. And that's at the end um, a Porsche with pure electromobility. So are any, any markers out there for zero to 60 miles per hour figures, anything? Um, 60 miles per hour, um, we will be um, below um, 3.5 seconds. So quicker than 3.5 seconds. Quicker, quicker than um, 3.5 seconds, and uh, maybe a bit more, and uh, we will, uh, we will communicate when we will launch the car. So what do you think that, I mean, the model, the top Model S, Tesla Model S, P100D, Motor Trend says they can do 2.28 seconds. Is that the marker? Might be. Uh, for Porsche always, uh, <laughs> for Porsche always was, was important um, to be the fastest on, on the racetrack. And um, that's not only um, the um, vertical um, acceleration, that's also um, the driving dynamics. And this combination, that sets Porsche at the end. I mean, the electric car race, the luxury electric car race right now is very interesting. We're talking a lot about torque. I mean, this is raw kind of power right off the line, very exciting. Um, but, you know, traditionally in the automotive industry, we've talked about uh, other speeds and abilities to do performance on a track. Um, what about the Nuremberg? How do you think it'll do there? The Nuremberg? Yeah. <laughs> I think um, we, we haven't uh, a special plan for, for this car um, to go to the Nürburgring. Um, we have been um, the last weeks um, with our um, GT2 RS on the Nürburgring, beaten the world record. Uh, with the um, fastest uh, sports car um, is released on um, public road um, with uh, 6 minutes and 47 um, uh, seconds. That's a lot below of the 9.18. And um, what we um, think about with the Mission E um, is to beat the world record um, in long distance driving. For example, um, what we can drive in um, 24 minutes, uh, 20, 24 hours. Hmm. And um, we haven't decided yet, but, but that might be an opportunity um, because um, of the um, very low charging time and um, the low distance you can run with a car, that, that might be a good idea. Do, do people want to buy an electric car, though? Do you think people want to buy an electric car? Or is this being driven by government regulations? Um, I don't think so. Um, uh, electric car is attractive. When you have a long distance, um, it will be able to drive. Short um, charging um, time and also um, uh, charging infrastructure is, is very important. And therefore, um, in, in Europe, um, we made a joint venture together with, with Ford, with BMW, and uh, with Mercedes to build up um, a high power charging um, network. And here in the US, it uh, will be done by Electrify America. It's a Volkswagen organization um, where you can charge um, up um, to 300 uh, kilowatts, which is important for, for those low charging times. McKenzie estimates that battery pack prices have fallen about 80% since 2010. And that to reach parity with a gasoline car, it's going to be another decade. Can you be profitable selling an electric vehicle, an all-electric vehicle? When Porsche will, will launch an electric vehicle, um, it will be profitable. <laughs> and um, it's, it's harder than, uh, uh, than a car with combustion engine because um, uh, the cost um, are lead um, by, by the battery um, package. Uh, there you have to work a bit harder um, on the cost side. Um, but um, on the other hand, um, there, there are a lot of perspectives for, for future. And when you look at the evolution um, of, of batteries, um, on the one hand side on performance, on the other hand side on cost, um, we look um, very, very positive to the future mm -hmm. to realize it. Does it, the situation help? Did you get scale through your partner, through your parent company, Volkswagen, and their ability to? to they've got very ambitious plans for electrifying their entire fleet or their fleet over time. I, I assume that there's some savings you find there. Would you be able to do it? Would you be able to be profitable without them with an electric vehicle, or do you need the scale? Yeah, what, what helps um, is the scale effect um, you have. Um, in the case of the Mission E, um, we use another um, battery package than Volkswagen will use. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, you have some, some components to, to share. 
And in future, uh, it's a big advantage. And not only um, to think about Volkswagen, you can think about Audi and uh, to do something together. And um, scale is affects um, are one topic, but um, on the other side, um, to work um, with this clever concept on the car to reduce costs. So the Mission E is going to be a four-door sedan, correct? Large sedan. Why, was there any discussion about doing uh, maybe an SUV first? The SUV market is very hot in the US in particular. The introduction of the Macan has really helped you in places like California where people are just in love with uh, small SUVs. Was there any discussion that or why did you go with a sedan? Yeah, for Porsche it was important when we launched the first uh, full electric car um, to come with a real uh, sports car that looks like, like a sports car. And that was always uh, the strategy um, from Porsche. We came from the um, 356 and the 911. And later on, um, we decided um, to go into the market with an SUV. It's a lot of success. And um, first of all, we want to underline um, what will be um, a Porsche able um, to, to bring on the road um, with electromobility. But uh, the Mission E um, won't be the end of electromobility. Therefore, there are a lot of ideas for, for future. Uh, when you talk about um, SUVs, um, you have um, the aspect um, of weight of the cars and of the aerodynamics, and, uh, which cost uh, distance. And therefore, you need a, a very good developed system um, we can later on carry over from, from the Mission E. And therefore, the decision went um, to, to a very sporty car. And um, then um, in, in future days, um, we might think um, about an SUV or a similar car. Do you, I mean, the interim between all electric and gas at this point, there's plug-in hybrids, and do you see more of those in the next few years? I mean, you're already doing a good percentage in Europe of, of plug-in hybrids. Yeah. We think um, the plug-in hybrids are very good bridging technology, and um, our um, strategy for, for future will be we stay on... Um, very good um, um, combustion engines with, with a high performance. Then um, we will go for plug-in hybrids and for electric. And that will be for the next 10, 10 or 15 years. And um, we have a very good experience um, with our new plug-in hybrids. Um, they came with a new Panamera last year. And in Europe, um, we have a take rate uh, from around about um, 50%. And um, one secret of the success um, has been um, to come with our, our high-end engine, with a 680 horsepower engine in, um, in the Panamera, um, to, to get um, also um, customers. They always um, take our cars uh, with a high-performance engine. And customers, they never thought about to go to the plug-in hybrid, and now driving a plug-in hybrid, and, and they are fascinated. Um, about the combination. You are able um, to drive full electric um, 50 kilometers distance um, uh, in town. And when you get out of town, you have acceleration helped by um, the electric engine. That is uh, fascinating. We're in California here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about California. Um, the small SUV introduced in 2014 really helped you here in California. It was a big increase in sales. I look at sales from last year in California. They were up but they weren't up quite as much as Tesla was in California. Is Tesla a competitor of you? Or are they a threat? Mm -hmm. First of all, um, our um, organization, Porsche um, of North America, um, with headquarters in Atlanta, is very happy about the situation um, in California of all the Porsche fans in California. And if uh, California would be um, a country, it would be uh, the fifth largest market um, of the world for, for Porsche. And um, that underlines um, the Porsche fans here in, in this, this country. Um, talking about Tesla, um, I think um, I, I've got a lot of respect for what they are doing. Um, without their innovations, um, uh, it wouldn't be possible that all the automotive industry changed so fast to electromobility. And, um, I think what um, Elon Musk um, is doing there, um, he, he's, do, he's um, thinking um, in a very wide way um, uh, to, to the future, very visionary, and um, has, a, has a very good combination in between um, digitalization and, um, and the car. Situation actual um, of the company is um, that um, he gets to the limits um, because um, 
he hasn't got a, um, a car manufacturer. And um, what we have to learn um, on the digitalization um, side, he has to learn to build to build cars. And um, but I think um, he's a very good um, competitor, and I've got a lot of respect. That's a great segue into to your new role at Porsche. I've known you for a lot of years. I remember talking to you in 2010. You were one of the few analysts in the automotive industry who saw the convergence of Silicon Valley and the traditional auto space. Um, you probably could have gone to any of the number of companies here in the Valley starting automotive activities. There are a few, probably people who work in this room or involved in some of them. Why did you go to Porsche? Well, you know, I mentioned it at the beginning, right? I've always been a fan of Porsche, and, and you know, that made it much easier for me. I've always been a customer, and I know what the company stands for, what the cars can really deliver. We just touched on this with regards to e-mobility, and maybe just, you know, two sentences to that as well from my perspective. You know, I think a lot of Porsche guys here in the audience know that Porsche actually created electric vehicles a long time ago. Ferdinand Porsche developed one of the first electric cars, you know, with... Uh, engine mount or wheel mounted uh, motors for, for the vehicle. So it's always about performance and it always has been about winning races, really never giving up and really pushing everything to the limit. And that was really attractive to me from the very beginning. And I think right now at this intersection of where the automotive industry is going with the whole digital transformation that's happening, it becomes even more important that you're very clear about what your brand promise is and what you can actually do in a digital dimension with that brand promise. And it's not just about making the cars more attractive the way they are today and maybe you know, enabling other capabilities inside the car that are digital, but it's also about what else we can do with regards to mobility. What can we maybe even do with regards to lifestyle? Because a Porsche is more than just a car, right? I mean, you don't buy a Porsche just to get to point B. You buy a Porsche because you want to have a smile while you go to point B. And that's a very different value proposition that we have from a lot of other vehicle manufacturers that are out there. And that's where I think, you know, once we launch an electric vehicle like the Mission E, we will make sure that we hit on these performance elements. And I'm pretty sure we'll set new benchmarks for a lot of things that, the, that people haven't seen, that the industry hasn't seen yet. And that was, for me, the motivation actually to do this at Porsche, because there's a big change coming. So if we're talking about a world of cars where the human isn't driving, um, is, does Porsche, is that helped? by the fact that maybe just the, the, the luxury buyer will be buying cars they can drive? Or does Porsche have um, some kind of special spot in a world where its brand is maybe infused in the idea of, of mobility as a, as a service sort of thing? Well, you know, so you always want to drive a Porsche, right? So I'm sure there are like Porsche customers out here. Can you just raise the hand? I just want, want to see how many of you drive a Porsche. So a lot of, <laughs> this is good. Half of them, this, more than half. This kind of represents our market share in the US. No, I'm just kidding, that, that would be nice. <laughs> Um, but you know, at the end of the day, we always want to make sure that you have a steering wheel in the car, right? So I don't think our interpretation of uh, self-driving vehicle capabilities means that we'll do a robo Porsche. No robot that, taxi cars. Right. You know, I don't think that's today what we're thinking of. You know, there might be a solution that we will use to provide end-to-end -end mobility where something like that might, might fit into, but we want to make sure that people can really enjoy the Porsche for what it is to drive it. But at the same time, if you're stuck in traffic on 101 here or 280, which is getting worse, by the way, I feel like every day, then you know, we want to give people the ability to push the button so that we offer that capability to them. But you always have the choice to come back and take over you know, and drive manually again. And that, to us, is a big differentiator how we're thinking about this. You know, and it's interesting. Ferry Porsche coined the quote uh, many years ago. He said that the last car ever built would be a sports car. That's what he said a long time ago. And I think that is so true because people that buy a Porsche really appreciate the car for being a sports car, and that will never change. So a car might become essentially what a racehorse is, or a horse is today, something you ride on the weekends? Or? I, I don't think so, you know, and I, I'm not convinced yet. You, you mentioned a couple of stats at the beginning of our discussion. I don't think it will happen like that, um, quite frankly, because there are just too many people out there that like driving a car. And that whole idea of having freedom that a car provides and control is something that we as humans are, are, have deeply inside of us. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that it's really that exciting to sit in a car that drives itself all the time. I've been doing this for many years since I've been here in the Valley, and you know, at the beginning I was really excited about this, and then eventually, very quickly, you feel like being a passenger mm -hmm. in the driver's seat. And that's just not cool. That's not fun. And I, I, I think, I think um, it's a combination to, to have a very sporty car that can you drive by your own, 
but um, use or have useful um, applications of autonomous driving. When you think about uh, traffic jams, uh, you will be able to, to check your emails and um, you will be driven by, by your car. Or, um, for example, um, you, you have a meeting or um, you, you go to a restaurant um, at night and um, it's, it's fully parked and you get out of the car and um, the car um, will park um, by itself. That's very useful. Um, and um, when we think um, about applications of autonomous driving, um, we also think in very typical um, Porsche applications. Um, for example, um, to have um, application that drives you on a racetrack um, uh, we think that that's our project name. It's, it's a Mark Weber app, um, was a known um, Formula One driver um, and um, Le Mans driver. Um, and he takes um, you um, on a digital way on a racetrack and afterwards you do it by, by your own and compare how Mark Weber is braking, um, how Mark Weber um, accelerates the car and to find the um, ideal course to go to the racetrack and um, this um, will be a very helpful application of autonomous driving and um, have the combination in between driving the car by yourself but a useful um, part of autonomous driving. When do you see that as an option? <laughs> <laughs> Soon? <laughs> Next few years? Um, but potential. I, I, I was, was able to, um, to test a prototype mm -hmm. to do that and um, <laughs> And in one moment you think, oh, will, will the car break and um, um, will, will it work? And um, it's, it's already um, able to, to do that, but um, to be um, very sure at the end um, and, and safe, um, I think it will, will take some, some time, mm -hmm. but um, we won't wait uh, 10 years. It will go much, much faster. I mean, as a CEO of a, of a large organization, you, you must be trying to balance the desire to be in the future, but also pay to your roots, so pay attention to your roots. I mean, uh, tonight, several people in the audience have come up to me, and there are two questions. Uh, one question is, hey, I have uh, purchased a Porsche. It's coming from Germany. Do you have any idea when it might be here? Could you ask on that? And we'll get to the Q&A here in a bit. And the other question is, uh, well, are these cars becoming too computerized? Are we taking away the thrill of driving? Mm -hmm. what, what, how, how do you weigh that? that, that? Yeah, for, for your, your last question, um, it's, it's like I said um, at the beginning, a Porsche always will be a Porsche and uh, you will recognize it and um, we only um, put in a Porsche um, digitalization um, where um, our, our drivers have an advantage. And uh, there are a lot of very good um, um, digital um, options, but um, we won't digitalize everything. You can do um, thousands of things, and we will concentrate on the 10, 20 um, most important things which will be helpful for, for our, our drivers. Um, but when you get into the car, um, you, can, you can feel that you sit in a real Porsche. And um, therefore, um, we also um, will uh, carry a lot of heritage things from, from Porsche to the future and combine it with, with new technologies. Um, to your first question, um, to understand you, you're right, is um, if we will um, produce um, one time um, in, in States um, a Porsche or... Well, I think there's some individuals here who want to buy some cars. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you founded Porsche Digital a year ago, right? Right. And what does Porsche Digital do? And five years from now, how will we know if it was successful? So what we do is we, we define kind of the path of where Porsche needs to go to expand the success that the company has, right? So that means we create a vision, we create strategies based on this, and then we come up with you know, new offerings that really provide that value proposition. In the car, like I said, with regards to maybe mobility, and then also the lifestyle elements. So we're looking at, at those three dimensions. And in order to do that, we also build prototypes, we create new service offerings, new offerings in general for consumers around the world in different markets because these markets are different. And in order to do that, um, and that's the reason also why we're here in Silicon Valley, we're looking for partners. So we're looking at an ecosystem that we want to create with partners, you know, experts, uh, companies and experts in technology areas, maybe in certain service areas that we actually want to bring closer to Porsche. We want to share our knowledge with them. And of course we want to benefit from their knowledge and maybe even jointly create things going forward. So we're very open to this because that's the way Porsche does things. We always look for the best partners 
they can help us do these things. But we have, we have a pretty clear vision of what we want to do going forward. And the success will be based on, I don't, I don't know if it's in five years or maybe longer, but the success is based on can we take advantage of the opportunity that this whole transformation that's happening will provide us with? Because to us, it's an opportunity. It's not a challenge that we're afraid of. It's great because it's exactly the things that Oliver talked about. We'll offer a lot of these technologies inside the car, but it's up to you as a customer to activate them or not activate them. We leave it up to you. But there are other things that we want to do outside of the car that will make you feel very much like a Porsche customer regardless of where you are. So it's not just limited to the vehicle. What you do before and after is equally important. What, what could some of those things, what might they be? So think about the fact that you know, Porsche stands for a couple of very strong attributes, right? It's precision, it's performance. It's really getting you to where you want to be in a superior way, fast, quick, the things that matter, saving your, saving your time. And those kind of attributes we can apply to a lot of other things, including even maybe simple things like what you do on your weekend, how to actually you know, think about what to do on the weekend. We want to help you to make the best weekend plans based on the weather, maybe based on your you know, preferences that you have, maybe based on your social kind of network that you have, and maybe we involve a portion in that as well. So we might offer you a really interesting trip suggestion that includes a vehicle and has all kinds of other um, benefits attached to this. And we're using really technology to do that. We're actually working on exactly those kind of things. And that's just one small example. We want to actually involve or be involved in a lot of things that you let us be involved in that are related to your life. And that could be even having the ability of an assistant, a virtual assistant being with you that provides you always with a look of the world that's very Porsche specific. And that's a really interesting area. So a lot of the stuff that we're doing now at Porsche that we're doing at Porsche Digital is based on the work that I've done here over the last 20 years. And I developed a couple of theories and assumptions based on this and how technology will evolve. And if you think about it, you know, you're holding your phone in your hand. Today, all of us are using applications on the phone. You know, little icons that you click on, you get a piece of information, a burst of information. We want to change this. We want to actually curate things for you going forward with a specific Porsche value perspective behind this. And the brand provides that North Star that will actually guide you in that area. And I have a name for that. I call it actually the Internet of Me and not the Internet of Things. And Porsche can really provide you with that lifestyle experience, which, of course, comes from the car but extends into all kinds of aspects of your life. Does that Porsche experience live in the iPhone or the Android system, or does it become uh, some kind of new platform? You, you, it's you, ubiquitous at the end of the day, right? Imagine almost being like a halo that follows you regardless of where you are. And you know, whatever touch point you have, a phone, you know, maybe a tablet, or the car, will interact with you, will actually make your life easier and more exciting. And it's really that excitement and the intelligence that we want to provide to create that aspirational lifestyle that Porsche stands for. That's where we see the opportunities because that's what it means. Digital transformation at the end means you, you're kind of resolving or you're dissolving the, the boundaries of an industry. And you're really taking advantage of new constellations that could exist. And that's where we have a lot of passion. And of course, we're coming from these strong products, the cars that we have today, but there's so many other things that we're envisioning, and we're working on those. I mean, it really sounds like you're talking about using AI for a personal assistant in the vehicle. Companies in this town and this community are working on that as well. As an automaker that's lived in the hard world world for so long, how do you develop that software skill, um, which is perhaps not something that traditionally has been in the, in the automotive space? And it might not be just the software that we're looking at, right? So we might actually work with partners, and that's really that ecosystem thought that I talked about earlier, to get the expertise from the partners. But for us, it's the orchestration of all of this mm. at the end. What do you do with the technology? Because I'm a strong believer that technology has to become so seamless that you don't even feel it. It just happens, and it provides you with real value propositions at the end of the day. And we want to focus on those value propositions by working with the brightest minds in the valley and different places in the world that can help us to get these technologies into the hands of our customers. So you're, you've opened an office here. Yeah. Um, you're staffing up. You yep. hope to have 100 people eventually. Yep. Um, is there any particular technology you're looking for? Is, if, if somebody's in the audience and they've got um, a flux capacitor, should they talk to you? <laughs> or If they really have a functioning one, yeah, they should talk to us. No, but uh, yeah, maybe. But we're really interested in uh, you know, a lot of different skills, right? So it's definitely people that really want to do something, create something, that are visionary as well that understand what the Porsche brand stands for, and then having people on the developer side, for example, that can help us do this. 
equally the on the UX side. So everything that we do is centered on the user experience. Again, it has to be intelligent, you know, exciting, and aspirational. So we need those kind of people that really do things. But it also includes people that are interested in working with startups, work uh, on prototypes, really pilot things. Bright minds that really get excited and infected by that Porsche bug, you know, to really be part of a great story that's becoming even more interesting and that started a couple of decades ago. And um, so to add, to add something, um, Tilo Tilo was, was talking about um, the technologies uh, we are thinking about. And um, what I think is, is the most important point, um, we, we just started to, to build um, an ecosystem for, um, for Porsche. And this afternoon, uh, we had the opportunity um, to talk uh, with Tim Cook from Apple. And um, I think that's the best um, example how to build an ecosystem um, for, for a brand. And in our ecosystem, um, we combine um, applications for connected car, for um, electromobility, and uh, for modern mobility. And combine all, all the things and um, to have the opportunity to get in all these things uh, with a Porsche ID of a system we call it uh, My Porsche. And there um, we um, will design all, all these um, applications and together with partners. See, the beautiful thing is it's not like it was five, six, seven years ago when you didn't have all the technologies available. Today we're in that unique position where most of the technologies that we need are available. And it becomes a question now of what do we do with these technologies? And I just believe that from a technology evolution and maybe disruption perspective, um, what will happen in the next couple of years is that people and companies will start thinking of, if I have all of these technologies, how can I create something that really enhances and improves your life? And there, a brand will play a pretty big role in terms of how you do this. Because we want to identify ourselves with brands. We want to identify ourselves with specific you know, attributes that the brand stands for. And that's where Porsche has a unique opportunity that I don't see with any other vehicle manufacturer. And quite frankly, not with any other major brand either. Because think about it, what other product do you know today that you get so excited about that you, as a child, you know, play around with as a toy car, and if you become an adult, you hang up a poster and say, one day I'm gonna own one of those. So it sounds like you're not willing to turn over the cockpit experience to a company like Apple. <laughs> um, I think um, you, um, you can copy um, some, some solutions from, from Apple what they did very good um, in a in digital business. But um, I think our secret in, in future will be to combine all these opportunities with a real heritage of, of Porsche. Who's a bigger threat to the future of the auto industry, Google or Apple? <laughs> we don't talk about threats. Um, we talk about opportunities and, and partnerships and um, I think um, um, we can, in, in the automotive industry, and that's not only Porsche, um, all um, our competitors as well, can learn a lot um, of um, the digital industry. But I think um, for, um, for these companies, talking about Google, for example, um, at the end, to build their own car, they um, have to learn a lot about this uh, complex industry um, of, um, engineering and, and producing cars. And therefore, I think um, they won't be um, a threat. Um, and um, when they um, will look for, for partnerships, that might be um, the right um, way for, um, for companies coming from, from digital business. And um, for, for our companies in the automotive business um, is to learn um, from the digital business and um, to look for, for partnerships. Is it, if you were a mass producer of cars, would you be more scared right now of the future? Are they the, is the threat that they become the handset maker of I, I think there's, a, there's a you know, big benefit to the fact that we're very specific, right, in terms of what we do, what our products stand for. That's definitely a big asset because if it's just about transportation. Yeah, I do believe there will be other alternatives going forward where you might not even own a vehicle. Um, but even if that's the case, we're looking into those things as well. You know, we just started a pilot in Atlanta called uh, Porsche Passport, where we give people the opportunity to just, you know, sign up on a subscription plan, and then for on a monthly basis, you can get for you know some money um, the kind of Porsche that you want. We can switch it. You can actually change cars you know, from the 911 to the Cayenne. 
So we're looking into, the, into those aspects as well. But I think if you have no specific brand recognition, no specific performance attributes, yeah, there will be a challenge. At the same time, you know, with Uber and Lyft and all these companies being so successful over the last couple of years, we haven't seen that car sales go down. And that's why I'm not convinced yet by some of those statistics. I think all of us will drive more, and the ones that will suffer will probably be the public transportation companies, quite frankly, because at the end of the day, all of us still want to be in our little capsule. And a lot of you guys here in the audience, like ourselves here, like that capsule to be a very sportive one. Well, you just announced the other day um, a, a joint venture with Axel Springer in Germany, the media company. What, what is a media company and a car company doing together in a joint venture? What, what's the vision there? So yeah, we're very excited about this. So this was just announced uh, a week ago. And uh, Axel Springer, you know, for those of you that are not familiar with it, it's, it's a very big media company in Europe. It's a German company with a European footprint, actually global footprint for that matter. And it's the first time that two companies out of different industries are forming a joint venture for an accelerator for startups. I mentioned earlier that for us it's very important to have an ecosystem approach and that we're looking into innovators from around the world. And that means also startups, even very early startups, you know, people that are just at the process of beginning to have a concept, an idea, and now they want to turn it into a company. We want to help those organizations, and that's why we joined forces. So we'll actually have a space for these companies to come to, to continue developing their ideas, plus, and that's really the value of this, you know, we'll give them a little bit of money as well, but that's not even the, the key aspect. The real benefit is we will help them understand how to become a successful business, and we will help them to build together jointly prototypes. So if we find somebody, you know, maybe even here in the audience who says, hey, I'm really interested in this, this is, you know, this is an interesting uh, company and we have a really great idea that we want to bring to Porsche, come and talk to us because we'll actually work with you and implement those innovations in our products and do something unique and do it really, really fast. Porsche is known for being very quick, not just on the road, but even with our processes because we're a smaller organization. And that's what that is about, you know. And that's the exciting situation today that you can learn a lot of um, other business models and other, other industries. Talking about um, Axel Springer, um, 10 years ago, um, it was a traditional um, press company and um, they changed very fast um, to um, digital business because um, um, the media industry has got another pressure. And um, today, um, Axel Springer has over 70% um, of their business um, on the digital side. And there we can learn how to change uh, the company and um, pick up some, some interesting startups and to do it together. And, and you know, the, the interesting aspect is, and you asked me earlier about why did I join Porsche? You know, the, the people within Porsche, and in particular also the board that we have, meaning this gentleman, but also this gentleman over here, we have two people here from the board, Liz Meschke, the CFO, they're very open to this new innovation and new way of thinking, which is very unique. You don't find that everywhere in the automotive industry. And being willing to even extend you know, your own thoughts beyond the industry that you have been in for most of your life is a pretty big accomplishment for a lot of the automotive companies that are out there. Most of them can't even do that. So that's where we're looking into working with Axel Springer and working with startups to really focus on those aspects. And there are other partners, by the way, as well. I see somebody in the audience from Eventures. You know, Eventures is a, a VC um, that we're working with as a limited partner. And then we have great relationships with a bunch of others that are here in the audience as well. I think one of the knocks against the automotive industry that you hear in Silicon Valley is that the, the clock speed is not fast enough. Uh, the ability to, to move quickly and innovate isn't there. And some of that is, is there's a reason for that. Regulations, um, it's complicated supply chains. Um, it takes years, five to seven years to bring out a new product. Um, what have you found being inside it now? You've been on the outside, now you've been on the inside. Um, is Silicon Valley right that car companies are too slow, or do you see a way to, to speed up product development? Look, if, if you do software, if you do software development, everything else will be slow by default. That's just the way it is. But building a product that consists of thousands of different parts and is life-size and actually has to survive in a crash to protect you, that's a very different story. You can't do that in a, in a sprint that takes a week, right? It, you need much more discipline in order to get a real good product out of this that also has the highest quality levels. So are there aspects in an automotive company, including at Porsche, that we can accelerate? Yes, absolutely, and we are. 
we're working on this. You know, I think we're pretty open about this, even in, inside of our organization, to say, let's change the processes that we have in, in place. Let's become even more agile in many areas. And we're doing this. We're doing this across the company, and that's where the benefit is of, of operating in a smaller company that we are, compared to you know, humongous companies that are out there, to actually do that successfully. But at the same time, I think you have a very strong focus within Porsche on driving excellence, because the products show it. You know, that doesn't happen by coincidence. If you think about our racing history and, and the racing activities that we do, that's real stuff. That is not made up stuff, that's real. And you have to be super fast to come up with new developments, you know, thinking about what, how to change vehicle's performance and so on and so on. And we're applying that knowledge to a lot of other things that we do. As a matter of fact, we even have a business called Porsche Consulting that does that and we sell that you know, because we're really good at that. And the AJ um, organization is a good example. We, we learned from, from Silicon Valley and we are using um, this kind of organization to speed up our processes and um, for example, we um, develop our new HMI system um, for the Mission E in this kind of organization or the thermal management um, of um, our, our new engine and that helps us um, to get the speed we learned from, from here. <laughs> Ready for Q&A. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to wake up, wake up everybody. <laughs> everybody okay? Okay, so I don't know if anybody can still hear me. Uh, one of the, the big innovations that Tesla has done is over their updates to the software in the vehicle. So essentially, like your cell phone, your car can be updated to software. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've seen things such as battery management change. We've seen the, the ludicrous speeds and these sorts of things. Um, we hear a lot of automakers talk about getting to this ability. Uh, in most cases, the conversation is about uh, probably looking for uh, fixes in the car, or telling the, the, hum the driver to bring their car in for, for, for changes or something like that. Does everybody hear me now? I'll talk really loud. Uh, <laughs> let him turn it back on. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. No, it so we, we're talking about over there updates. Do you have a, what, what is your vision for how to use that technology? Do you see an, an ability to generate revenue there? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking about you know, turning on features and functions in the vehicle, right? Not mm -hmm. just to provide a software update. That's part of it, too. But we want to really focus on giving you new things after you purchase the vehicle. Okay. There you can think, um, for example, um, and uh, we will come um, with these features um, with the Mission E um, to get an update with, with your um, headlights um, in winter for example, or uh, when you want to go on weekend um, on a racetrack um, to, um, to get a special um, sporty um, gear application or something like that, and uh, that you can um, get um, um, over the air um, and um, can, can buy it um, in your car. Okay, so we have uh, folks with microphones. Raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll start getting those around, and we'll ask another couple questions as people get mm -hmm. the microphones there. And uh, you know, talk to me. We've we've talked a lot about Silicon Valley. Um, what do they get wrong about the car business? <laughs> what does Silicon Valley get wrong? What what assumptions do they have wrong about the car business? I think you know some of the Silicon Valley companies may have seen this mm -hmm. in a simplified way to build a car, because that's really a, a skill set that you need to acquire over over a long time, right? A lot of the established companies have done this for decades. To, to just think you'd buy a factory and then you know everything happens magically just isn't like that. It's physics. It's really you know mechanical processes, right? That that come together. Chemistry. If you weld things and so on, and and you really have to understand what that means if you do it on mass and scale. There are hundreds of processes behind. Uh, when you look uh, at the launching situation um, in in Tesla, for example, you have to um, manage um, a lot of companies um, and suppliers. Um, you have to manage your, your own um, processes and um, to make um, a quality system and so on. And uh, what Thilo said, um, that's learned um, by decades and um, you can, um, you can uh, learn it overnight to, to applicate it. Okay, do we got a question out there? Hello, uh, as a native to the Bay Area, I want to say I'm fascinated by Porsche's decision to come to Silicon Valley. And my curiosity as a longtime follower of the mark is how you, in coming to 
Silicon Valley where there are so many icons, whether it's HP or Apple or, or Google, so many more. How do you intend to, and what opportunities do you see? Porsche has its own history. You're bringing Schwabia here, and the brand has a, a differentiation about it. It's always done things differently. You can boil it down to more from less, but there's also a heritage of rear engine and smaller expensive cars. The 356 was the small car that was the same price as a Jag or a Corvette or something with more power. I'm curious how you intend to, in coming here, maintain the differentiators of Porsche and its culture, its heritage. So I, I think it's exactly what you just described. You must be a Porsche customer, you know, knowing all these things, or at least you're a fan, I can tell. There's something going on there. Um, but, you know, I think it's exactly that, always keeping in mind that we're different and that we want to create an experience for our customers, right, to put a smile on their face, to really make them, you know, use their car driving it down highway one as a therapeutic toy, right, or, or tool, I should say. Um, that's something that we want to really focus on, and, and we have a very unique sweet spot in that regard. I can tell you from the discussions that we've had so far with technology companies here, you know, the big ones and the small ones, there's a lot of excitement to work with us on finding out exactly how we can innovate together. Okay, next question. How many years would you speculate augmented reality will be incorporated into the service side and user experience side of Porsche? Mm -hmm. Augmented reality. So, you know, we're definitely already working on some of those things. Um, if you think about it, the car is the ultimate mobile device, right? That's something I've been saying for almost 20 years now, and it, it's really coming true in the sense that it's mobile and it's a device. And in that sense, if you think about all the real estate that you have, all the glass, all the abilities to use technologies to create a world around you, to me, it's the perfect device for augmented reality in the future. And we're working on a couple of very specific uh, areas uh, as it relates to that context. Mm -hmm. So two examples, um, when you think about um, augmented reality, um, the new um, head-up displays, um, you will be able um, to use a real um, driving situation um, on your road and um, to um, make, make your, your driving situation um, better than before when, when you have a um, better orientation by augmented reality. Or uh, we use augmented reality um, for our customers um, in um, our Porsche dealers, um, where you can use um, a system um, without having the car, but um, having the sensation to, uh, to feel the car and um, to, to choose your, um, your options you will get. And, and therefore, I think um, there, there will be a lot of opportunities uh, for future with augmented reality. Okay, next question. Is it working? There okay, you yeah. thank you. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the Nürburgring record. It's exciting. Um, and uh, I have three quick questions, one for Thilo and two for Dr. Blume. So the question for Thilo is, how do you plan to compete for talent? Because hiring smart people is the key to building a great product. I mean, if you look at Porsche history, you're at, you had Hans Mesker working on the engine and you had amazing racing drivers like Walter Roll that are were always part of the team and helping Porsche win and succeed. So when you come to Silicon Valley, how are you going to be able to recruit the talent here? Because here, everybody wants stock options. And last time I checked, I don't think Porsche is going to give out stock options. So that's question number one. The two questions I have for Dr. Blume are the 911, uh, the 991 uh, series Carrera is getting big, and I think 992 is probably going to be even bigger. Are the days of the small and efficient sports car at Porsche over, or is that going to shift more to GT4 and GT4 RS type cars, and then we're going to see those? And the second question is similar. Porsche used to be a really exclusive brand. To have a 911 was something that was very uh, exclusive, and people were actually looking to go to Porsche for exclusivity. Are the days of exclusivity at Porsche over, and are you just going to be producing a lot of mass production cars and making limited edition cars every two months um, that people kind of get overloaded with to some degree? Mm -hmm. 
So let, let me start then first. Thanks, Jan. I was expecting way more difficult questions than that. So that's that's cool. Um, you know, uh, definitely. You know, I think there's a challenge. Obviously, there's a lot of competition here, right? So I spent the last 20 years in, in Silicon Valley. I worked with a lot of the companies in this in this area. Yes, we might not offer stock options, but you know what? We're offering up the opportunity to really do something great with one of the most recognized brands in the world, and really moving the needle on that you know front. And I can tell you that we don't have a shortcoming of people wanting to work with us. You know, we posted a couple of job postings only so far, and we got 600 applications right away. And then we had the trouble of going through them because the brand, what it stands for, fascinates people, especially with the vision that we have and the mission that we're on, what we want to do for the brand so that you know, the next generation of, of customers, kids today, are getting as excited as us when it comes to the Porsche brand. And you know what, yeah, we don't offer stock options, but we offer a car, you know, as part of the benefit. And let me tell you, you know, sitting in one of those 911s, who cares about stock options? <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question, um, first of all, um, the 911 will ever be the core of, of our brand. And um, it will help to, uh, to answer. Um, with, with our product strategy. Um, we have four lines for future, um, where we look of um, dairy weights and um, different segments um, coming from, from our um, basis models. Um, the second um, will be image products um, like uh, GT, um, GT3, GT2, uh, GT4 um, um, for, for the Cayman, for example. Um, then uh, we will have um, image products um, lifestyle, um, um, lifestyle products, um, pardon, lifestyle products um, for um, using heritage things or um, thinking about um, a spider or something like that. And um, the fourth um, column um, would be um, electromobility. And um, we will um, continue to develop um, very fascinating puristic sports cars coming from the GT line, um, all the experience we um, can take over from motorsports to, to our cars. And um, we have more ideas um, to make this line even bigger on the um, GT side. And we think um, that will be very important um, to drive Porsche to the future, um, to make um, um, or to stay on our route and um, to have a credible, um, credible um, brand um, to continue with this options for the 911, for the Buxter, for, um, um, for the Cayman, and on the other hand, um, to, to invest in electromobility. And the combination will be for Porsche in future. Now, I was able to see some of those cars that are coming out, and I can tell you, it's awesome. All of you will be very happy. <laughs> okay, well, we've got a few more minutes. Any more questions? Okay, great. Hi, so when you were talking about the brand, you were talking about driving, right? The cockpit experience, the control. What I didn't hear is the experience of buying a car or servicing a car. What disruptions do you see there? Do, will we ever need to walk into a dealership ever again in the future? Are there other models that could work? Um, how do we make the brand experience carry throughout all the touch points? Mm -hmm. So we're looking to all aspects of how we can you know, improve things, make them even more comfortable, make them more exciting for um, our customers, and that includes the retail experience. At the same time, you know, we're really happy that we have dealers, um, especially also in this market, because that's a unique value proposition in our eyes. And we can imagine that those dealers going forward will even do other things on top of just the sales business of an automobile. And we're giving them the tools that they need to have in order to do the best job that they can. So you know, we're looking at all of this, and we're, there's a, a pilot that we're running right now, for example, in uh, Canada, um, with a startup where you can actually do a virtual showroom visit. And you can actually look at your vehicle that you're interested in from everything, the options that you have, you know, the, the stitching in the car, you can look at everything right there in the same way that you will almost be there in person, which is great. I can tell you that if I would have had that option in the past, I, I would have saved the way of going down to LA in order to pick up the car that I wanted even though I was living here. And that's just one example, and that's something we do today. And we're looking to all kinds of other things that we want to do in the future. But think about that going forward, the retail experience and the dealer experience might actually do all kinds of other things for you as well. 
especially with regards to new mobility offerings that are out there because it's a physical product, it's a car. So you still have to go somewhere or the car comes to you, but it needs to be serviced and there are other aspects of what we can provide in that experience. And we're very much driven by making sure that you get that exciting, intelligent and aspirational experience wherever you are. Talking about uh, touch points, um, I think it's very important and our organization in, in the US, uh, in Porsche of North America, it's got a very good relationship to, um, to all our dealer organization. And whatever we will um, develop, we will do it together. And uh, one very interesting option uh, for future will be a digital platform where you, as a customer, can, can buy your, your car. And at the end, um, do it um, together with, with the dealer, um, to, to talk with the dealer, and at the end, um, to buy and to configure um, your car at home. And um, therefore, a lot of options um, we can do together with, with our um, dealerships. I was going to take another question, but before, beforehand, are, are, do you see the ability to order a car online in the US in the next two years, or is that something only for Europe? Might, might be an option as well. Um, um, it depends um, always um, on the um, time um, you um, you, you want to wait for, for your car. Build to order needs needs a time, and um, we do a lot of um, build to order in um, in Europe, for example. And uh, European uh, customers love it, and I think um, there will be opportunities in future for the U.S. market as well. Okay. The question from the audience, please. No, it's not on. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, with the democratization of technology, whether it's machine learning, additive manufacturing, robotics, the ability to personalize things. What risk do you see, like three guys opening up a car company in their garage and that happening over and over again to the market that you're in right now? Yeah, I think that might happen, right? I mean, that's how a lot of start, uh, companies, automotive companies started out a long time ago, by just having a couple of people in the garage doing things. But I've witnessed this now over the last probably 10 years, in particular also in, in the Valley, of companies trying to do that, or look at China, or all these you know, companies that are coming out. Um, it's really important that you have a heritage and that you really understand what it is that your customers are looking for with your brand. It's not about just building a car. That might indeed become easier if you have a, you know, a vehicle that's uh, based on batteries than it used to be. But to do that at a scale and to do it safely with high quality standards and have people excited about it, that's a whole different story. So I'm not worried about that at all. Next question. Here we go. It's all you. It's all you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'd like to ask if there's any plan for Formula One. <laughs> any plan for Formula One, he says. <laughs> Hi, thanks for um, taking my question. My name is Yoon, and I work for Samsung Electronic. And thank you, very for, thank you very much for taking my question. I'd like to make a couple comments before I ask my question. I was born in September 11th, 9-11. All my emails ends with 9-11. My phone number is 9111. <laughs> Cool. So I've been a long time Porsche fan. <laughs> and uh, thank you for producing such a wonderful sports car. Um, I became a proud owner of 991.2 GTS just this summer. I took a European delivery, probably the best uh, vacation experience I've ever had. I liked it so much, I was trying to bring my wife to pick up Cayenne from Leipzig. The next thing I know, the program is not offered anymore. So. This may be a very specific question, but I want to understand what happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, from, uh, from the production side, um, we um, uh, introduced um, the new um, Panamera with a full process in, in Leipzig. And therefore, um, we um, decided um, to uh, um, build the new um, Cayenne um, in, in Bratislava. Um, Bratislava um, in, um, in Slovakia was, was a supplier from, from the Cayenne and we did the final assembly in, in Leipzig. But um, from the whole process, it's better to do it in, in one plant. But um, to get the car um, in, in Leipzig, there won't be um, um, any problem to do that in, in Leipzig. There, there you can get all, all the Porsche cars. You can, can get them in uh, the 911 in, in Leipzig. Um, also, 911 is produced in, in Stuttgart. And uh, we can arrange it. It's not a problem. That was a good question then, right? You got a good there answer. You go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Okay, next question. Yeah, hi, M Mark Platchon. Um, most of the auto companies talk a lot about trying to become mobility suppliers. And I'm having a hard time picturing where Porsche embraces becoming a shared mobility or mobility supplier. Is, is that a trend that you think you can resist? Or is there a way that, that it fits? See, uh, it's not about transportation for us, right? It's not just about getting you to point B. I think there are other companies out there that might be better positioned to do that. For us, when we think about sharing, it might be actually sharing the experience of driving a sports car, a Porsche sports car. And that's a very different value proposition. But even there in that segment, we believe there's a sharing component in it. But again, very different. It's not about scaling and, and now getting everybody into a Porsche. That can't be the goal because it's still something exclusive. It's probably still something that's expensive. So we're thinking about this differently, but we're looking at all of those aspects that you know, are coming out of this uh, transformation that we're seeing right now. Okay, next, next question. One more. Hi, Danny Shapiro from NVIDIA. Thank you very much for, for being here. It's really uh, been a great talk. So motorsport is obviously the heritage of, of Porsche. Um, everything that's going on, we have a lot of dot AIs here in the audience. So now we see artificial intelligence maybe and motorsport combining um, there's something called Robo Race that's out there that's developing to have autonomous race cars. What, what's your view of this, and do you see Porsche being a part of that in any way? Mm -hmm. so I think um, um, what, what Porsche does in, in motorsport was always um, kind of motorsport um, where you have a driver, and um, Porsche will be in future a driver's car. Um, where we use um, artificial intelligence um, is maybe for application. I talked before, um, like, a, like a Mark Webber app, uh, to train yourself. But uh, we at Porsche are not fans um, of uh, robot driving or something like that. It's only to, um, to develop um, technology and use it um, for, for useful application for, for our drivers. But uh, Porsche um, in future always will be a driver car. And what we do in motorsport will always driven by, by a real driver. Yeah, at the same time, we might use AI to better tune our vehicles, those kind of things, right? But like Oliver said, it's not about just putting up a car with no driver inside because, again, that, that defies kind of the value proposition that's focused on the experience mm -hmm. at the end of the day. When do you think you might get traffic jam pilot or something to that effect that can do level three and by level three driving, I mean turn the vehicle over to the robot, but not a, but in some limited situations, maybe navigating traffic jams or highway travel or something to that effect. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will launch um, level two um, with, with a new Cayenne, and um, there you will go um, into a traffic jam um, up to, to a speed of um, 60 kilometers per hour. Um, level three depends a lot um, of the legal situation in the different countries. Um, when um, the legalization um, lets um, the car um, free to drive on the roads without um, um, the, um, um, the possibility um, to get in um, by, by the driver. And um, from the technical side, um, it will be possible. And uh, we have driven um, a lot of cars um, on, on level three. Um, but I think it will um, last um, a couple of years um, um, in, in, in Europe. And in, in the US, I can't, I can't say um, how's the situation. And, and we ask in, in Google um, the same thing um, today. Um, but um, from the technology, it will be able um, um, in a few months. Next question. More questions out there? We've got a, yeah, there we go. We've got a, a little bit more time for a few more questions, so keep coming. If we can take suggestions for what the, the mission E should be called. You haven't picked a name, right? <laughs> <laughs> something, maybe you should do something with AI in the title, because it's popular these days. You know, we'd had a presentation here a couple of years ago on smart cars that talk to other cars on the road, shared road information, shared what's happening up ahead over the hill, that sort of thing. Uh, potentially in a racing environment, that could be interesting. If, have you thought about that technology and adapting that at all? Yeah, so we're, we're looking into all kinds of aspects of how cars can communicate with each other in all kinds of different applications. 
and racing might be really interesting for that one, right? Even for maybe not professional kind of you know amateur racing, it would be interesting to do that. Because if it, that improves safety, why wouldn't you do that? So that the cars can avoid any problems and that we don't see any crashes anymore um, on, on racetracks either. Um, I think we have to see how well the technology can perform. You know, and there was a lot of talk about car-to-car -car communication in the US as well. I remember that a couple of years ago, and we haven't really seen that much today, which is kind of unfortunate. And it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg thing, right? So somebody has to mandate it, and then everybody has to do it. Then there's a benefit. If otherwise we would be the first ones that have the technology, boy, we would be very lonely and talking to ourselves and nobody else out, outside there. So that might be a challenge. Okay, a couple, just a couple more questions. And it uh, looks like we got two hands, so. Maybe. Hi, I was just wondering if you could talk about who your technology partners are in autonomous driving and whether you're using Mobileye or NVIDIA or someone else. Thanks. Wait <laughs> for that question. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're, we're, we're publicly commenting on this, you know? Mm. But um, there's certainly some people here in the audience, I think, that we're talking to already that kind of know, you know, who they are. But uh, <laughs> I don't think we're, we're ready yet to talk about this publicly. But stay tuned. Uh, hi, Pilo. Hi. That's a question for you. Um, as you know, when talking about uh, digital and car technologies, that one of the contentious issues is actually who owns the data that comes off of the car. And I'm wondering where Porsche comes down in that area. Yeah, so this, this is a really important question, Phil, right? So thank you for that one. So we, we always want more, we'll make sure going forward that we protect the data. We're only doing things on behalf of the customer. And we don't really want to own data. We don't need data for that matter, right? We want to only gain your permission to actually you know, temporarily giving us access to information that you provide us with so that we can in return give something back to you. And we will always shield that data. Um, and that's very, very important to us, right? Especially in a car that you trust with your life, especially in our cars when you go on the racetrack, we'll make sure that we also protect your privacy. Um, we might need some information from you to do an even better job you know, serving you well and, and doing new things that we're talking about, providing additional value adds to you that might be services in addition to the car. Um, but we will always you know, ask you for a very little bit of information and only with your permission and not share it with anyone. That's extremely important to us because that's how we have been treating our customers since the company was born. Okay, last question. We've got it. Okay, uh, go. I've been uh, You've been talking a lot about speed and innovation. I'm just wondering about how Porsche works with the regulatory side of things where dot regulations are notoriously slow for that, so you're building a separate car for the US versus meeting EU spec. I'm just wondering how that kind of relationship works in terms of getting updated laws on the regulatory side for all these great ideas that are coming out from Porsche. Yeah. So we're really active in that space as well, mm -hmm. right? And of course, that's where it helps to be part of Volkswagen Group because then you have a different scale and then Volkswagen can talk you know, to regulatory bodies on behalf of 12 brands. And that has a very different kind of weight to it than you know, if it's just one company, maybe one that's even smaller than, than other companies that are out there. But definitely we also push the envelope on a lot of things. We go to regulators and show them, look, this is what we could do mm -hmm. if you would give us the infrastructure to enable it. And I think that's where you know, it's frustrating for car companies in general to see that the governments are not moving fast enough, right, and quickly enough. I mean, just talking about self-driving vehicles, we need certain technology infrastructure to be in place to do that really well. And it should be in the interest of governments to actually put these technologies down. And um, that dialogue is definitely something that we want to intensify going forward. And I think um, it's always the best way um, to start uh, from the beginning on to talk with the authorities um, to involve them in the new technologies. Um, and uh, to speed up, uh, to free them and release them um, for, for public roads. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Good conversation. That was it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you so very much for sharing your perspectives with us this evening. We do have a small token of our appreciation. It is the Churchill Club speaker t-shirt.
Oh, thank you. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Please wear that in very good health. <laughs> Uh, a recording of this program will be available on the Churchill Club YouTube channel shortly. There you will find recordings of most of our other programs as well. We hope that you find that to be a very useful resource. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much, and see you next time. Good night.